Okay, so um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I wanted to welcome you to our last session, the Triton Leaders Conference. Hope that you've all been enjoying hearing about the different ways that we're battling health disparities and bringing up health equity. Thank you for staying late for this session. We're all, on behalf of the panelists, myself, we're so excited to share with you a future project that's very exciting at the Hillcrest Medical Center today. So we're going to go through some questions. Um, we will also sh save some time towards the end for your questions. So jot down your questions and we'll, we'll kind of group them all together towards the end and have like an open session there too. So I'm Helen Liu. I'm the Executive Director of Development with Health Sciences. And um, I'm very, very privileged to have my colleagues here. They're really the ones who are deep into the, the, the I, I don't know, deep into the, the weeds. weeds, thank you, <laughs> about what the Hillcrest Project is. And so without any more delay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. The first question that we're going to have is for David Muir. David is a Director of Health Community Relations at UC San Diego Health. And he leads the institution's strategic public engagement and community benefit initiatives. His key responsibilities include developing and implementing organizational plans for strategic community partnerships and advocacy initiatives, including several nationally recognized public health initiatives. So you can see why we've asked him to join our panel today. <laughs> so David, um, the first question that I have for you is, can you share about UC San Diego Health's Hillcrest campus unique role, including any specialty services offered that address health equity? Yeah, thank you for the question, Helen. And thank you again to everyone who's joining us today to hear more about this incredible and special and transformative project that we have at, um, taking place at the Hillcrest Medical Campus. Um, as Helen mentioned, um, I've had a lot of unique roles with the health system over the years. But um, more recently, I've been involved in the Hillcrest Redevelopment um, Community Outreach and Engagement um, process. And that's lent a lot of um, time and experience now working with the team and my incredible colleagues, taking our um, long-range development plan out to the community um, so that the community could actually get um, a good uh, bird's eye view of what's going to be taking place there. Um, and so I'll just do a little bit of table setting for those that may not be f as familiar. With our Hillcrest campus, it has a long legacy and wonderful history um, that is unique um, as a healthcare system and provider asset to the San Diego region. Um, just to start off, uh, we actually, um, it's, it's a pretty special uh, story, um, but right around um, the mid-1960s, uh, the county of San Diego was going through this uh, process where uh, they were uh, evaluating how best to provide access and expand their clinical reach to the community. They operated one county hospital at the time, and so they were looking at a way um, where they could partner with other providers throughout the region and uh, to expand access and their um, status as a safety net provider. Um, at the same time, UC San Diego School of Medicine had just opened up, uh, and it was looking for um, a clinical teaching facility where they could expand their residency program and start to provide access to that, that core piece of our mission, which is to be an academic health institution and to start to, um, you know, go about the business of teaching doctors um, in a clinical setting. <clears throat> so at the time, in, at, uh, we um, uh, got in touch with the county and again, stars aligned and um, it turned out that they were looking to um, lease out or, um, uh, you know, basically find a a caretaker and provider to take over the Hillcrest Medical Campus. It was operating at the time as the only general hospital again. Um, and again, it met our needs as a school of medicine. So uh, again, stars aligned. We took over the operation of that facility. And since then, we've uh, been uh, the clinical lead. The license has been under the UC Regents, and we've operated the Hillcrest Medical Center. Uh, since then, um, the campus has grown quite significantly. If we could go to my first slide. Just to give you a, a little bit of a visual here. Um, on the top, you, you see the, the photo of our current campus layout. Um, it has been a bit of a circuitous, hodgepodgey process, <laughs> but the campus has grown over the years quite significantly. Um, we went from a, uh, a single um, large, again, general hospital that was operating there, a large facility, 
And since then, the campus has grown to about 38 facilities, if I have that right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, different buildings operating different clinical um, uh, programs and services. We have research space. We had a uh, medical teaching library there in operation at one point, and a number of wet lab space. Just, again, um, facilitating our tripartite mission, mission, which is to be, um, uh, you know, provide excellence in um, education, um, the medical, clinical practice, and then also research. And so this campus has really facilitated all three of those things over the years. Again, uh, Hillcrest is a unique situation. Uh, it is operating in a, you know, the urban core of San Diego um, in a residential neighborhood. It is very much tucked away uh, in the Hillcrest neighborhood, um, if you're all familiar with that. Um, and to get into the campus, uh, you know, it, there's select streets, the, you know, one-way streets to get in there and in, then to get out of the residential neighborhood. Uh, we have neighbors very close to our facilities that have, uh, you know, that have grown to, uh, to love and to understand what we do there <laughs> over the years. A lot of interaction with our neighbors and um, that's very much coming into play now as we're looking towards or have started our uh, redevelopment process of the neighborhood. Uh, if we could go to our next slide. <clears throat> so David, um, oh, yeah. let me interject with a question. Sure. Can you share the general vision of the new campus? Yeah. Specifically how that's been shared with the community. And have you had an opportunity to get input from the community? Sure, yeah, if we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> so um, just to uh, kind of again, um, give an overview of our long range development. Plan. This is a comprehensive, forward-looking, um, five-phase, multi-year, uh, 15-plus year uh, vision for the redevelopment of our Hillcrest campus. It's split up into five phases. Uh, this is kind of a quick overview of some of those phases. Um, but one of the things in the impetus for creating this plan was um, some years ago, the state legislature uh, created uh, new seismic um, requirements for inpatient facilities. And so most providers, you may know of Kaiser, Sharp, Scripps, we're all going through this process right now of, um, of redeveloping our inpatient facilities to meet new earthquake standards. And so um, this in part is our uh, plan to eventually get a new hospital at our Hillcrest facility. Um, before we get to the hospital phase though, there are multiple phases before that starting with our first phase, which we're in now, which is um, phase one. Uh, that includes uh, the, um, the building of a new outpatient pavilion, which is a whole new level of service that hasn't been provided to this um, region um, at our um, facility in the past. So that'll bring in new service lines, a lot of new uh, care models and other things that my colleagues will be addressing in shortly. Uh, but again, just to give you an idea, we're, we're going to be going for about 15 plus years, uh, again, culminating in a new hospital at this space. And um, yeah, just to, yeah, I don't I, know if you want to share did, more? Yeah, David, I did want to say we, we have, and you can actually speak to this, I think, uh, with more certainty, but I know there have been lots of community forums. Oh, yes. We've yeah. been talking to the planning commission. We've yeah. talked, I mean, there's there's been... <laughs> Yeah. Many, many meetings. Yeah, and, I could jump into that. Yeah. Town halls, yeah. So just to, again, sorry <laughs> to get back to the question. Uh, uh, yeah, the amount of uh, community outreach and engagement we've uh, conducted for this um, leading up to the approval of the Long Range Development Plan, and now since then has been quite extensive. Uh, you know, we have obviously our residential neighbors that live right next door, but then there's the community as a whole that is going to be seeing a whole new level of service and um, a lot of construction during the next 15 years. So again, leading up to this, um, to this plan being adopted by the UC Regents in 2019, we had conducted a number of presentations with all hosts of um, neighborhood groups, the you know, uh, planning groups, the planning commission, the city councils, the, every elected official under the sun. <laughs> Uh, getting it out into uh, local uh, media and newspapers to let them, everyone know uh, that this plan would be taking place. And then not just that, we went um, above and beyond also to make sure that we were mailing out uh, mailers pretty frequently to make sure that our neighbors were aware of those steps. And even now as the construction has uh, begun, we're, we're making sure that our neighbors are aware of um, the major milestones that are taking place there uh, and so on. You know, I'll just throw out a quick um, 
shout out. We have a little uh, website, hillcrest.ucsd.edu. Um, it is a great repository of information regarding um, our efforts at, um, at as part of the Hillcrest redevelopment. So if you have time, it's a great place to start to get a little bit of an update, a little bit more information if you're interested in that history and the process as we've gone. Thank you. Yeah. So, Siobhan, um, I'm going to ask you another question because we started talking about the models for care. Siobhan Carino is a health justice and equity implementation coach with UC San Diego Health Justice Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion team. She is an anti-racist healthcare leader with over 20 years of progressive experience in healthcare operations, promoting person-centered equitable care and clinical excellence with a successful track record of leading highly engaged and cohesive teams. Welcome, Siobhan. Thank you. So um, kind of piggybacking on one of the topics that David touched upon, Siobhan, I'm wondering if you can talk about this. Recent market analysis shows 67% of the almost 700,000 residents living south of the I-8 here in San Diego, they live with chronic dis conditions and diseases. How will the future Hillcrest Medical Campus address this? Thank you so much. I actually began my um, entire career in Hillcrest. I was in Hillcrest for 10 years, and so it holds a special place in my heart. Um, this um, campus that we're, we're looking towards in the future and in, in phases um, will really provide accessibility for those patients, right, dealing with chronic disease, whether it's neurological disease, which is my specialty, or others. Um, in my time in operations, we used to hold these multidisciplinary clinics, which brought in a physical therapy discipline or a respiratory therapy discipline or all of these things so we could have our patients have access to all of those things at once. And for me, this is the larger iteration of that, right? Um, we know that, that people who suffer with chronic disease have, you know, mobility challenges. Maybe they don't drive. And Hillcrest being in the, the central hub for this care really, I, I think, takes UC San Diego Health to the next level. A lot of these things were primarily available in bulk in our La Jolla campuses. So doing this in Hillcrest really serves the community and provides a space where someone can come, see their provider, get their physical therapy, get their blood drawn, get their imaging, and then you know go home for the day and rest and, and take care of themselves. So UC San Diego Health includes dismantling structural racism as part of the bedrock of their operational strategic priorities. Can you talk about what that actually means? So structural racism, and I brought my notes because I'm going to make sure that I get this right. Um, structural racism really um, exists and speaks to all of the isms, if you really um, think about it. There are three mechanisms of structural racism. There is uh, residential segregation, redlining. There is mass incarceration and police violence, and inequitable health care. All of these things constrain um, individuals' behaviors which lead directly to health issues and health disparities. Um, I like to think of it, my leader, Dr. Um, Crystal Sine, who um, leads the entire JEDI department, who, that's Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion for short, um, explains it like an iceberg, right? At the top, we have quality of healthcare and access to healthcare. But what's really underneath those challenges? We're looking at money, we're looking at power, we're looking at resources. And so when we look at minoritized groups and the healthcare disparities that affect them, we see that those three things really drive that. Um, and so as we move forward in developing Hillcrest and just developing UC San Diego Health in general, our team and soon everybody in the organization will really be doing things that address these things that contribute to structural racism. Um, and what we'd like to see is it affect areas of like internalized racism and intermediated racism. So structural racism really is the foundation for ensuring that our patients get the equitable care that they deserve. So could you go a little deeper about the connection between health equity and racism? Mm -hmm. Cody, could you be on my slide, please? Keep on going. No, next one. It's probably toward the end. Yeah. Keep going. There we go. Um, race, structural racism, um, we know it unfairly advantages some and um, unfairly disadvantages others. 
So we lead with race um, in health equity, understanding that there's intersections of gender and age and, and all these things. But at the end of the day, when you look at the research, when you look at the evidence, race is the factor that, that affects all of the intersectionalities that, that we look at. So focusing on this racial equity provides an opportunity also to introduce um, other frameworks and tools that can be applied to other areas of marginalization. We look at it through what we, uh, Dr. John Powell from UC Davis calls it a targeted universalism framework. And so we take maternal mortality, for instance, right? America doesn't, doesn't do well in that area in general as a developed nation. But when you break down and stratify the data of maternal mortality by race, you see that black women are disproportionately affected. That is one of the major contributors to the overall poor maternal, uh, poor maternal mortality rates. So if we focus on improving the care that we're giving to black women, that's gonna improve the care for everybody and overall help reduce that disparity. Thank you for that, absolutely. So, so David, um, let's go back to David Muir. Sure, yeah. How does the UC San Diego Hillcrest Long Range Development Plan hope to address health equity? The, yeah, the if we could go back. Great job. Oh, sorry, Explain. sorry to cut you off. Go back to slide one more, one more. I think this one covers it for the most part. Yeah, I really appreciate Siobhan's comments at, about um, you know, the nature of um, how uh, our built environment, how planning uh, can have impacts on our um, quality of life and the health um, of our community. And um, our long range development plan very much, as Helen mentioned in the question, um, has uh, taken this into consideration and is really trying to advance um, uh, planning um, uh, principles that are addressing a lot of these health disparities or social determinants of health that impact the quality of life throughout our community. Um, just to highlight some of the um, aspects of the long range development plan that meet these um, issues, obviously transportation and mobility are one of the key um, areas where uh, people's lives are impacted um, in this community. Um, again, just narrowing it down to our Hillcrest um, environment, we have a number of roads and streets that were, again, circuitous, highly impacted, congested, lots of traffic. Um, our long-range development plan uh, really keyed in on that. Um, and during our first phase, we're doing a number of amazing projects um, where literally there's a small street called Bachman Place, if you're familiar with this, this, road, this area. Um, <laughs> here one person room. Uh, it was kind of the secret passageway between two communities, between <laughs> Hillcrest and um, Mission Valley. And for those that live in this neighborhood, that was the road that, you know, that connected these two communities. There really wasn't another option for another mile. Well, the health system is going so far as to work with local um, planning agencies, SANDAG, uh, MTS, and others to, exp um, to level this road, basically create a new... Um, the, remove the incline that it's at right now. We're gonna straighten it out, we're widening it, we're gonna add bike lanes to it, it's gonna be part of the bus rapid transit um, system. This is meant to not only just get people in and out of our um, hospital um, or, or into the um, clinical uh, campus, but also to provide this new access point for the community, right? So the neighbors are gonna be able to benefit from this. Our, our, Again, a chief, a chief principle for us was to give a new access point for emergency medical transport. So now, um, instead of going on to Washington or this other congested road, we have another option to get folks in to the hospital, into our emergency rooms, to our trauma centers, and other critical care services there. And that, you know, in the trauma world, time equals, you know, um, access to, to care, and uh, it saves lives, you know. So. Um, that's a huge improvement. There's a number of small projects like that, that where we're changing the built environment in order to improve mobility and access. Um, the environmental uh, quality <laughs> and standards and practices going into the construction of these new facilities um, are all meeting our climate action plan for the UC um, uh, regents, including the city of San Diego's uh, climate action plan. Um, and there's just a number of these um, uh, efforts that are built into this plan that are really going to be leading to a whole new, um, you know, quality of life for this for the folks that live and work around the campus. The other major piece that I'm just going to throw out there and highlight really quickly is that not only are we now going to be a medical campus, Hillcrest has historically been just clinical care, 
but we're adding um, a whole new aspect to it. We're adding um, in two phases um, uh, workforce housing, a thousand units of workforce housing. This is transformational. Um, our uh, faculty and staff and employees will now have access to be able to live and work and play in the neighborhood where they reside. And um, so that's going to be incredibly transformational. And there's amenities that will go along with that housing, uh, green space, access to a wellness center, and other things that we're um, building out that are not just going to support that workforce housing, but the community itself. The community had input in on that entire process, and it's just going to be, again, this, this big transformational project um, or effort for the community. So hopefully I address that, <laughs> that question. I'd like to piggyback off please, what yeah, David yeah, says. Um, we're currently in the process of joining the Healthcare Anchor Network. And the commitment with the Healthcare Anchor Network is really to invest in the economic sustainability of the communities we serve. And so this really just does align very well with that. There will be plenty of employment opportunities, like you said, the housing, the sustainability piece. So it's really in alignment. I always love to see that when we're doing things yeah. <laughs> in alignment and um, will really help us as we continue on our journey to becoming a Healthcare Anchor Network. Yeah. And may I just, I want to jump in on this long range development plan. David told you how the hospital was a, a county hospital and it was there first and it was it had that location and then this this campus has grown up around it but it was never planned that was always iterative and organic and <laughs> and we've got maybe some of the best places for some of our best health care um, not on you know we 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 have just grown the way we needed to but with the long-term development plan we were able to say where does it make sense Absolutely. to put the, the patient care areas. Yeah. You know, we've, we've, there's so much study surrounding the healing nature of the built environment. And uh, with our Jacobs Medical Center up in La Jolla, we have views, some of them even of the ocean. We've found that a room from every single view is so critical. So in the long term, uh, in this uh, long range development plan, the replacement hospital will be out on the bluff with those incredible healing views. We didn't have an opportunity to do that the, the way we have now. And so, David, you mentioned there are 38 buildings. When we're done with this, only two of the remain of, of the original 38 buildings will still be standing. And um, it, they are buildings that needed to come down. They're not seismically uh, uh, appropriate. Some were old houses or apartments that people had turned into offices. So, uh, you know, I'm always one about renovating rather than raising, but uh, these, what that does give us the opportunity to do is create that open space, which is available for the entire community and the wellness center at the front door of the community. And um, we wouldn't have been able to do that if we wouldn't have taken this absolute holistic view of the site, which is a remarkable site. I'll talk a little bit more about how constrained it is and, and what challenges we've had with that and the opportunities that come with that. But it's, we ha we're where we are now because we, were, we started with a building and we grew out from that. And now we're planning it with all of that involvement from the community. We're, we really, it's going to be something very special. Yes. Yeah, so it, that was Kristen Hill, oh. <laughs> Senior Director of Facilities Planning and Health Campus Development. Um, she has over 20 years in facilities design, construction, planning for professional experience, um, especially with healthcare ser services. I, I would think that this project is probably so exciting that, like you said, it's not renovation. You really are starting with a cart, you know, with a uh, blank yeah. canvas there. Yes. And I know that you're going to show some schematics a little bit later, and um, that'll be very exciting to kind of show this audience what it looks like. But D David, you know, I saw um, while we were scrolling through some of the slides, sure, yeah, right. there was some there was something about maybe Medi-Cal or some of the community benefit that we yeah uh, um, provide right there. And I think yeah. this would be a nice one just to kind of show um, tying into what Kristen was just talking about, providing with every population. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, Siobhan could add to this as well because uh, she may be more familiar with um, th what you're seeing here on the screen in the slide is a snapshot of. Um, not only are, um, it's the Medi-Cal coverage per system um, uh, as a percentage of our market share. So depending on how large the system, you know, Sharp is probably the largest, uh, Scripps comes in a second. We, we represent about 15 or plus percentage of the market share. 
But um, given that, um, what this slide shows is that um, although we have a smaller uh, size, we, um, by our proportion, still provide more care to the Medi-Cal population in this county. Um, it just goes towards our mission of providing care and access to all um, San Diegans, regardless of um, their payer status, their insurance model. And again, it's a commitment to the underserved in their, our communities to be able to continue this um, model. A majority of this um, care comes in different forms, you know, but um, a lot of this care is provided at our Hillcrest Medical Center. Um, and um, so again, it's just pointing to this, um, to this history and this legacy of the medical center being a, a true asset for the region um, to all populations, including our Medi-Cal population. It really does, yeah, no, David, you captured it, it wonderfully. Um, a lot of time, or in the past, at UC San Diego Health, a lot of the more advanced um, treatments and things have been located on our La Jolla campus, and this brings it central, again, to the community, and it makes it accessible. Many people who, of our underserved, underinsured populations, may not have cars, may not um, be able to make it to La Jolla. Um, the new Hillcrest um, OPP and, and the entire plan will bring it to the people, right? And bus stops, like you said, there's gonna be a bus stop there, also in, in one place. So there's not this one hour bus ride, you know, to the Hillcrest campus on Monday and then having to go back there Wednesday for this. So they can really consolidate that and and protect their time where they can spend that time again caring for themselves and doing the things they need. Yeah. So it's really great. Yeah. So Kristen, I wondered, um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about what the future plan looks like and maybe especially with the redesign and how it will advance health equity. Sure. Um, first of all, I wanted to just uh, piggyback on what you said, Siobhan, the outpatient pavilion um, really does bring a lot of that advanced diagnostics, the, the cancer care, the infusion services, the prenatal services, all of that right there on the campus. And I, and what I love about it is that there, the campus will now be designed in such a way that caregivers can stay there and can enjoy and, and have a, that place to be as well. Um, <clears throat> That's such an interesting question, Helen, and I'm going to kind of, if I might, I, I'm going to, I'm going to talk both about our patients and about the future of healthcare, but also about our teams, mm -hmm. and equity on teams. And I'm going to, um, we're going to uh, run a, a time lapse, and I'll, I'll kind of take you through it and show you, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk over it as well. So this will be a time lapse video. Um, of all of the of all of what David was just talking about, and you'll get to see us uh, really go through here. And so this is now your you're coming into the campus, and that's the outpatient pavilion you see there. And on the right is a parking structure and that Bachman Road that Dave just talked about. I saw some eyes when he saw said we're flattening it out. There's still an incline. It's yeah. just a much more gradual <laughs> incline, yeah. and it's. And uh, I'm imagining how, you know, uh, a big uh, bridges and all of that. But uh, <laughs> so uh, this is the outpatient pavilion. And then off to the left, and you'll see it as we go, will be the uh, big open green space area. We've even talked about uh, having movies out on the lawn and having the community be able to come and see movies that are projected against the building. And um, of course, we will continue to have, we have our Bannister family house here on this campus, we'll have a future for the Bannister Family House. So again, that's health equity. I don't know if any of you know about that. Some people compare it to the Ronald McDonald House, which is just for children. But um, if we have families who are receiving care here who need to stay close, and if their family needs to stay close and they don't have any other opportunities, we have housing for them as well. Um, so one of the things I did want to talk a little bit about teams, but David mentioned it, the, the workforce housing, which is amazing, the new, uh, the dedicated bike lanes, the dedicated bus lanes, and really having that, that transportation hub here is really helpful. It's, uh, you'll see as we go through this, um, and from what David showed you, it's a constrained site. We're on a bluff, and... Um, 
when we create our new hospital, which we're just in the pre-planning stages of right now, really talk, we're looking a lot at what Siobhan and Deva both talked about, about what is our demographic? Who is the population we need to serve? And you can see that was just, we are just up on this, this node here and we don't have anywhere else to go. And we have environmental um, impacts that we need to be aware of. So not only do we have a very constrained site, we have height limits, we have all sorts of things we need to do. Our goal would, to be, would be to be the, build the very biggest hospital that we could to see as many patients as we can. And we're, but we're limited. So, you know, and this is a hospital that's gonna open in probably 2032. What is the future of health going to look like then? When we think about what we've all learned through COVID and telehealth, I mean, who doesn't love the appointments with your doctor on your iPhone. I mean, that has been transformative. And everybody just thought, we're just gonna do this during um, the pandemic. But like so many things we've learned through the pandemic, no, some, in some cases and in some levels of care, this makes more sense. So as we plan for the future hospital, we're doing, we're looking at what does that, that future of care look like? How can we put in enough backbone for the data we need for all sorts of amazing innovations like hospital at home? We have, so we can see more patients, but we might be able to see them quickly in the hospital and then care from them at home and have their, and make sure that we have all of that digital backbone that we need in the building. We need to make sure that there are things that go into this building that we, that allows us to care for all types of patients and uh, patient lifts throughout the entire building, which we haven't been able to do before. And that is not only uh, allows us to care for all types of patients uh, with all sorts of mobility issues, but also saves our staff and makes that healthier for our staff as well. Uh, the one other thing that I think um, I wanted to talk about that that you don't usually think of. I just talk about things we need to make sure go into the hospital. But we have an opportunity to look at what doesn't have to be in the hospital. And we have, you know, a uh, hundred years of hospital design of how we do things a certain way. Uh, we have uh, all of our supplies in our storehouse there. We uh, clean our linens on house. Uh, we uh, have a very large blood bank which we need to if we do certain current kind of clinical cases. We have a sterile processing department that manages all of the ORs when in fact, you really only need to have sterile processing in some new regulations for three ORs at a time. So we're trying to look very strategically at what doesn't have to go in the hospital because anything that doesn't have to go in the hospital that we can put somewhere else creates more space for more patient rooms, more ORs, more advanced diagnostics. So we're, and, and the, the really interesting part of that is it has to go somewhere, right? So we, we can look at where that needs to go out in the community. So now suddenly we're talking about the possibility of having a distribution center for all of our supplies or, or an offsite sterile processing department, or we already do a lot of this with, with our lab. And we get to take a look at our demographic, not just our patient demographic, but our staff demographic, because there's, there's equity, there's uh, inclusion that we need to think about that. A lot of our, our staff finds it, uh, do not live close to our medical centers, do not have cars, cannot pay for parking even if they do have a car. Uh, don't have access. And so one of the things that we have an opportunity to look at is where is our staff and how could we improve their lives by maybe uh, creating these distribution centers that make it more accessible to a, a workforce that we are striving to be more inclusive and diverse. So, I mean, it's, it's just different things like that 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 you might not think about, but that as we've been getting into this, we think, we have one shot to do this. Let's make this as impactful to as many of our, our stakeholders as possible. 
and you know, we can't see patients without our team members and, and, and their wellness is critical. I hope that answered that your question. Certainly <laughs> okay, that's okay, that's sorry, great. it's a little um, long-winded, but yeah. You know, Kristen and I were talking a few days ago and it, it was Kristen who actually brought to my attention that we also need to provide the same kind of care and well thought planning for our team members. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, because we're such a large employer here. Do, do we know approximately how many team members we have in addition to our doctors? Oh, it's well, over 7,000. Yeah, yeah. 7,000. That's a lot of for lives and families itself. impacted. And I just loved hearing from the role that you sit, Kristen, when you know that our leadership is looking at that as well. It's very Absolutely. Important. Um, I want to be able to uh, have some time for the audience to answer questions, but before we do that, if, I want to invite the three of you, if there's any closing remarks or thoughts and comments, and then we can pivot to questions. Yeah, Dr. I can Hillcrest. start off. I'm going to really just, again, you know, if, if you have an interest in this um, effort, this process, as again, we have these websites, I'll, I'll say it again, hillcrest.ucsd. Edu. There, there's a mechanism there where you can um, email us. There, all of the contact information. If you'd like to continue to learn more, or be engaged in this process, we'd love to to continue to share this information with you as this plan continues to roll out and as we move on to other phases. David, there's also um, a new form of communication that we're creating. Yeah, too. I'll I'll, I'll yeah. shout it out right now too. Yeah. Um, we're putting together a community newsletter as well. It'll be a quarterly newsletter for the community and for our internal. Um, audiences, um, so our patients and for our um, employees. And um, so if you'd like to sign up for that um, for that newsletter, again, go to that website. We'll have more information on how to sign up there. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be, yeah. So the, that, that newsletter will have like maybe construction updates. Construction updates. It'll have uh, spotlights and highlights about the construction process, uh, about um, specific uh, milestones that are taking place as part of the project, and then some highlights about some of the clinical services that we're going to be rolling out there. So it'll be a good a good source of information as this moves forward. Yeah, and I just, again, thank you for your interest in this effort. Of course. Siobhan? Thank you so much for um, your time listening to us today. And just be on the lookout. Our team is newly formed on the UC San Diego Health side, and we look forward to really being in community and working with our communities to make sure our staff and our patients are, are treated equitably and are getting the care um, that they deserve. So see more of us. You will see more of us. Um, yes, thank you for your time. I am so excited to have been able to be part of the health equity discussion as an, as an architect and a design professional and builder. It's, you, you don't automatically think that you have a role in, in this space. And I'm here to share that our institution takes this so seriously um, uh, about infusing this level of uh, access and equity into everything we do. I've not only been given the opportunity to do this, but been given the mandate to do this. And in every request for proposal I put, uh, I always put in uh, JEDI uh, requirements. I always ask people to say, what are their uh, companies doing to make a difference in this, in this environment and in this, uh, in this goal? And so uh, I just, I'm just so gra grateful to, to be working for the, the team I do and to see it actually um, so physically in what we're building in the future. Yes. And I will, I will end yeah. with my um, thoughts, too. I absolutely echo what Kristen is saying, and I also feel the passion from Siobhan and Dave and working with them. I mean, this is a once-in-our-lifetime project. This is akin to building, like, a, a mini city. And UC San Diego did not necessarily need to invest in the time and the resource to provide this health care facility. We could have maybe just consolidated up in La Jolla. But the fact that... Our population is growing. We are also living longer. We have folks who live in, you know, south of the Eighth and also in East County. We want to be committed to be providing health care for them in the most efficient and effective way. And the fact that we are the region's only academic medical center, and with that comes the research, both a wet lab, both clinical trials. It also comes with the education that only just 
sort of cross pollinates for the healthcare and the delivery of to be at a better at a higher standard. It it just is. I'm so pleased that we're going to be part of it. And I invite anybody. Um, we're going to go into questions. I, I saw your hand. Um, but anybody who has questions afterwards, if you don't have time, please find any one of us. And um, I think I saw that this woman had raised her hand first, and we'll go to you next, sir. Thank you. So first, I want to say more than a question. Just I want to applaud um, the intentionality and the um, the commitment to inclusivity. And everyone that I see on this stage, um, if you're representative of the people that are involved in this project, I'm really excited um, to see what's happening. Um, I appreciate hearing the right language um, when we start talking about inclusivity. And I guess the biggest thing, and, and this is something that I think UCSD across the board struggles with, is um, how can we help champion this so that people are aware of just how intentional you all are being and of the opportunities to engage and say something now because people often um, will not say anything when a thing is happening and then after it's happened have an opinion about what people should have considered. Yeah. David, do you want to take that? <laughs> That's a cheer dark Yeah, no, I, uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Absolutely, there, there are many ways to continue to co engage, as I mentioned, um, you know, we have these communications resources that are putting out um, just the, the basic information about what's going on there. Um, but if you'd like to be part in, um, of future planning efforts, um, we're, we're going to be going as the phases continue and as new projects are going to be coming online, we're going to have to go back to the community um, to, to, to re-engage, to explain these more current projects. And there will be these public comment periods, these mandatory things, but then we do more than that, right? We go out and ask for public input. And it's at those stages where not just our neighbors get to, you know, what they want to see on a local level, but on a regional level, if you are still interested in making sure that this asset is um, doing a certain thing or you want to put in a certain level uh, of input, uh, it will be at those opportunities where your voice will speak the loudest, I think. And so, again, continue to... Um, to look at those communications uh, that we're going to be putting out. Um, it's there where we're going to put out like the, you know, call to action to come and give us your input. And at any time, you could always email us with input. Um, and those are the easiest ways. And again, hillcrest.ucsd.edu. <laughs> I'm going to keep flashing that. Um, it, yeah, it includes, uh, it includes uh, I, you know, my uh, kind of vanity email URL there, or um, email there that you could send feedback to my department or to the planning team directly or to our environmental planners who are, who are thinking more about kind of the built environment around the, you know, the canyon side and those aspects to the projects. And, um, and then just the, the regular impact, the day-to-day -day for the neighbors, you know, hey, there's too much noise or dust or whatever it is. We have those feedback mechanisms as well. So they're all listed there on that website. And yeah, I really implore you guys, if, if you're interested in continuing to share your voice to, to really look at that as an option. Great. We have this gentleman next. Yes. Uh, uh, two questions, one of which is very quick. At one time, I heard there was a hospital built on the La Jolla campus called Thornton Hospital. <laughs> and then I never heard a word about it for a, well over 10 years, and then Jacobs Hospital was built. Did Jacobs absorb Thornton Hospital? Oh. And the second question, which is a diversity and inclusion question, I have heard that issues and challenges extend to the nature of the interaction between doctors and patients, that people in marginalized groups suffer from a lack of understanding, lack of empathy, and even shorter time allocated to visits. That last point, I don't think it's intentional in terms of how the schedule's put together, but somehow it seems so I've heard that it works that way. And I imagine that issues of this kind apply to any hospital anywhere, not just this one. But is that something that you uh, address in the, your approach to those issues? I'll just answer the, the Thornton Pavilion question. Yes, Thornton Hospital is uh, still there. It's, uh, it, it is attached, it's contiguous to the Jacobs Medical Center. Uh, it, the Jacobs Medical Center includes both the hospital, and we have specialty hospitals in there, and the Thornton Pavilion. 
but the Thornton Pavilion is still there, has all of the ORs, and it's, as I said, it's contiguous, and you, in the ORs are connected to the other ORs, so it is still there, very much still there. Thank you for your question. Um, our Health Jedi team is about a year old. We just grew from three members to two. Um, but one of the things we recognize is we need to look at home first. We have dedication to making care equitable for our patients and also for our team members at work. Um, and so there is a lot of work happening now um, really aimed at leadership and providers to A, provide education, right, and provide a safe space for them to ask questions that maybe they wouldn't ask otherwise, and to really, um, ba to really bake in equity. And in baking in equity, there's a lot of change management that goes with that. Um, but yeah, so our first leg of our strategic framework really is to, to look at home and make sure the people that are providing this care are educated and understand um, the impact of inequity um, and the reality of inequity when, when treating our patients and working with our teams. So thank Can you I for that. Can I say one more thing about that too? Is uh, our hiring uh, practices now uh, are very, uh, we're very focused on this in our hiring practices. It is a and so as we hire a more diverse uh, caregiving population, innately that's going to come along with it. And then we all, we are all involved in this training that, uh, and, and the opportunity to, for uh, better understanding. Yes, absolutely with the equity piece yeah. in our workforce. And even, even to speaking to that, we still, don't take for granted that an equitable workforce understands really what diversity is, really what inclusion is, really what um, belonging is. And so it's, it's education, it's boots on the ground. That's one of my, my roles is to really get into the areas and chat with people and form these relationships so they can ask the questions they need and continue to develop. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. One more question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to my Jedi on the panel, yes. <laughs> um, a lot, I work with a lot of our students that obviously have a more traditional science background and an interest in medicine, but they realize that their passion is related to social justice and giving attention to equity. And so my question to you is, is your job title or role something that's common for most hospital systems, or is it something that's pretty innovative and new? It's innovative and new, um, and I've been in the role for about a month, but I've been doing some of the work um, since 2020 um, when we were actually really given the go to really talk about what systemic racism does in healthcare. Um, so my role is very new, our team is very new, um, and we are working with the consulting group and working together. We're hiring on a community engagement strategist to help us reach out to the community. So if I could bother you for a super mini informational interview. What advice would you give to students that have an interest in impacting healthcare equity through more of a social justice lens as opposed to a medical treatment lens? If you could maybe share some advice. Find your allies, that's what I did. Um, I did a lot of work in the community bef um, outside of my like official job title and really struggled for a while to find those resources in health for social justice. Um, and so I eventually was like, you just have to start asking people. You have to start having these conversations. In these conversations, you find your allies. You find the like-minded people who want to do the work with you. And then it's very grassroots, right? You organize. And you, and you take those things and you organize together and really find a way to, to implement them on a bigger level and really have social justice be at the heart of it. We did it with our Health Disparities and Inequities Task Force. That didn't exist before COVID. But we recognized during COVID, um, it really, you know, ripped the Band-Aid off of all the um, disparities that already existed. So it was a very grassroots organizing. It was folks from pharmacy. It was folks from, you know, surgeons and staff. And so we really took the social justice work to heart and, and organized and, and took it from a grassroots perspective, at least in health. And I think people can do that anywhere they are, right? Thanks. Sorry to 
prevent you from moving forward, Cheryl. Okay. I appreciate your question. There was Thank a question you. right here. Did you see yes. or, um, or, or are we done? With that, um, okay. we're going to stay behind um, to answer any additional questions. Our time has run out for this public question. We please join me in thanking our panelists, um, <laughs> David Muir, Siobhan Carreno, and Kristen Hill. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for Thank your you time. Thank you for your interest, and I think we've got ABC Cheryl Harrelson is going to take the mic next. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Thank you. Good afternoon, and I want to say to my Hillcrest colleagues here, um, I have used the facilities at Hillcrest, been treated by doctors. It is the same quality of health care that it is in La Jolla. You know, so it, it is great community facility, but it is still UC San Diego. So best known in the community. I thank all of you all for being here today and for uh, giving us this information. I hope for everyone, uh, this has been as much of an enlightening day uh, for you as it has been for me. I'm Cheryl Harrelson. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Alumni. Uh, career services and a few other units uh, in my area. But I thank you for joining us on a Saturday uh, to be a part of this. Someone asked, how do we get this information out to others? Uh, it is by attending this. You are the advocates. We ask you to take this information back out to your communities, to your friends, to your families. Utilize what you know and get people involved with UC San Diego. We are here for the public good, and we intend to continue to do the public service uh, of San Diego, San Diego County. So I want to thank each of you all for being here. I'd like to uh, say to my team, thank you for putting on a wonderful conference, all of the hard work that takes to get here. I appreciate you very much. Um, but thank you to our speakers, to our panelists, and thank you to each of you. I encourage you all, one, to think about uh, our next events, joining us for our next events. In uh, this month, Black History Month, there are a number of events going on on UC San Diego's campus. Please join us. Uh, on campus, ucsd.edu or alumni.ucsd.edu. Uh, you can find out where those events are. Next month in March, Women's History Month, and you heard Dr. Carruthers say this morning, it's also colorectal uh, screening month, so you will hear a lot about that from our health colleagues. You all can tell him I remembered that, right? <laughs> and then in April, we will celebrate Cesar Chavez month. So join us for those uh, activities. We also invite you to join us uh, in May for the Alumni Awards and Celebration uh, Week and Weekend to uh, sort of memorialize this uh, special conference. We have a special guest with us, a student uh, who's a Warren student, uh, Keyshawn Tran, uh, who has, is a fourth year at UC San Diego. And, sorry, losing my notes here. Um, Keyshawn is, it is studying interdisciplinary music, visual media, and computing. He's an experienced uh, songwriter, music producer, and poet. Our students are so ambitious, and <laughs> I love this. He's performed with UC San Diego's Department of Music, TEDx, and he performed at the 2021 Alumni Celebration Weekend. Keyshawn was awarded UC San Diego's Breaking Barriers Scholarship in 2022 for activism and diversity through his music and poetry performances. Uh, Keyshawn, please welcome Keyshawn Tran. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Happy Thank you. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by saying hi, and I, for anyone that's met me before 2022, uh, my, I used to go by Keyshawn, now I go by Quishon. There's just a small difference, so just going to point that out. 
And I just wanted to start talking about uh, initiatives I'm taking uh, as a first generation college student, as uh, someone from a low income background and a son of immigrants. I kind of want to share about how I think healthcare should be more accessible for communities like mine. And I come from the San Gabriel Valley. And this past Lunar New Year, there was a mass shooting miles away from my home in Monterey Park. And my past two weeks as a student were chaotic. Um, I was grieving, I was worrying ceaselessly, and I just couldn't get my head in any sort of order. So what I wanna talk about is what connects all of us. And that's our human experience, our struggles, uh, our hardships, and they can be like the cracks in the windshield that we think are just gonna splinter open and just destroy everything, or they can also be the moments, the moments where we reconsider what we stand for and try to strive for something better. So uh, with that, I'm starting an initiative, and that last question over there was amazing because I'm, I'm also doing, and great answer, I'm doing things to start it. Um, I have an initiative called Project Direct, and my whole vision is to build cross-cultural solidarity starting on the UCSD campus using artistic performances and collaborations, which this is kind of one of them. So it stands for the well-being, uh, the collective well-being for all of us, and the team that I've started to build around it includes students, includes faculty, and includes people who just want to center on what can we do to be more compassionate. So I'm actively seeking partners in the community and allies as well. And, <laughs> and I'll be here after the conference to talk with everyone who wants to speak with it. But now it's time for the poem. And I just want to preface this with, I'm so excited for this poem. And I always think that each of us does have our own voice and unique ways to be able to share our story and our perspective. I'm coming in here as a student and as a poet, but you could be equally impactful in your role as a financial accountant, or as an educator, or as I don't know, someone's mentor. So with that, this is the poem. If my dream was a choice, I would choose for it to be related to my voice, related to the noise that comes from my heart and out my chest, the notes that form the air when I sing out my best, the warm breath that flows when I lay down a spoken rhyme or sing an octave. I can already feel the verbal vocalizations. The verdict is against all violations. I broke through all my limitations. The notes, the passages, the self-critic evaluations. I choose to see the best in others and in me. And that belief shines through every side of me. I radiate good vibes on my unique frequency. And it's personal as my fingerprint or my SSID. It's my inimitable pull in gravity. And we all have it inside of ourselves to achieve our highest ideals, even when we're dancing with our silliest insecurities. I used to have self-esteem issues being a short guy. But now I realize that giants are made up in our minds. And if I keep growing and keep showing up, it's only a matter of time until I tower over my fears and leave them all behind. When I look at myself in the mirror, I'll see myself clearer the enthusiastic believer, the optimistic fever of which I'm a receiver and transmitter in every single form I'm giving and loving in a cycle of brand new and newly torn, I fit into my body like a well-worn hoodie. I sing a melody like 88 keys. I generate energy like a laser light beam and I manifest the magic of kindness and giving and giving and giving. And isn't it crazy to think that time is not linear? Yesterday, I was doubting myself. Today, I'm seeing the better half of the man in the mirror. And the good in you and me, it's more. It's more than just half. It's more like exponential on an infinite graph. The love is so overflowing, it popped the cap. We celebrate like champagne bubbly on a victory lap. And me, I'm just swimming in it. Swimming in that self-respect. Swimming in that present moment. Swimming in the, I'm going to make a change even if I don't know exactly how yet? I'm diving through the waters with my O2 tank. I got, I got oxygen, optimism, and a whole lot of thanks for my mom, for my dad, and everyone in my corner along the way. I'm looking at my reflection, redefining my voice using a mission with me, myself, and I.
thank you all so much. And also, we had a beautiful translation right here. Come on, let's give it up. Let's give it up.